I told you that to tell you this. Fleeing the scene of evil is not an unwise thing. Are you tracking with me? Fleeing the scene of evil is not an unwise thing. But, but, there's another component that we also need to consider. This is kind of the crux of what I want you to see this morning and where we're headed in this series. Church, I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We're going to continue on with a series that we began last week titled The Good Fight. A Good Fight. How to Put Up a Good Fight. And it just seems natural and normal that if I'm talking about fighting, then tonight I would be talking about meekness and gentle. Now remember, we're talking about a good fight, not just any old fight. The good fight, which consists of meekness and gentleness. I want to read for you from our text passage, which is taken out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. just want to read uh, just maybe this one verse for you, and we're going to jump right on into it. Look at verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. By the meekness... And gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. It's some interesting language when we're talking about meekness and gentleness and a good fight. I'm going to be bold when I need to be. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each and every one that's turned on this telecast, and I pray in the name of Jesus that by your word, you would speak to each heart. Help us to know and understand, uh, Lord, not only in our head, but in our heart, in our spirit, man, what the good fight really is and how to conduct it, how to wage it with those that we come in contact with each and every day. I pray, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. Uh, keep your Bibles handy. We're going to put the scripture on the screen, but uh, you'll want to look it up and uh, keep me honest. And the Lord willing, we'll be back here in just a little while. God bless. People don't like to be told that. Again, I've told you why they don't like to be told that, but it's true. Pastor Terry, why should I care? I mean, look around. Man, we've got the lights. We've got the monitors. We can hear you very well. We have carpet. We have padded chairs. It's cool as a cucumber in this place this morning. And my family is here. Look at all us beautiful people. Why should I care about what you're talking about? That's a good question. One deserving of a, a good answer. And I'll tell you why you should care. Watch this. Lost people matter to God. Lost people matter to God. When you were lost, you mattered to God. Aren't you glad? Amen. Listen to Peter. Peter says this, Christ died once for our sins. Our sins, yours and mine. An innocent person, Christ, died for those who are guilty. That's you and myself. Christ did this to bring you to God. Beloved, there's only one way to God. Contrary to what people tell you these days, there's only one way to God, and that's through His one and only Son, Jesus the Christ. I'm glad. Aren't you glad there's only one way so I don't have to? Man, I was over at Lowe's one day this week, and this young man come up. He said, you're finding everything you want? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Y'all got 32 gazillion things in here that I could look at. You need to get rid of some of this junk. I'm glad there's only one way. That's not complicated. Whew. Lost people matter to God. Listen to me, new life. I tell you, I'm fired up this morning. I can't help it. Listen, 
lost people matter to God. Therefore, they should matter to you. And as an attendee of New Life Community Church, I hope and pray to God that if nothing else matters, that lost people matter to you. In fact, I believe they, they will matter to Jesus chasers. Watch this. When wickedness starts rearing its ugly head, and screaming and foaming at the mouth, I would say that it's fairly normal. Everybody say normal. I'd say it's fairly normal for righteousness to pull back just a little bit. Normal, I say. Let me elaborate on that. When someone confronts me and they start turning red and them little veins stick out on their neck and their decibel level quickly rises and their vocabulary turns from civil discourse to venomous rants and cursing and the fingers begin to point and soon enough the fist clenches and the sticks and the stones start breaking bones. Then those who are filled with Holy Spirit of God, immediately start hearing things from way down in here. They start hearing things like that which Solomon told us in Proverbs 14. Look at this. A wise man or a woman fears the Lord and shuns evil, but a fool is hot-headed and reckless. Job tells us this. And he said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Back to Solomon. I love this. Solomon says, A prudent man sees danger. So apparently he doesn't have his head in the sand. A prudent man sees danger and takes refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. The Nooner Nightingale version would put it this way. Beloved, when the rocks begin to be thrown, the prudent people look for a tree. <laughs> Are you with me? Now, you can certainly make a personal application of these verses and quote-unquote inwardly refrain from personally engaging sin. This is number four on your notes. This is key. Just as clearly in many instances, I am prone to say in most instances, you have to make a decision to also physically remove yourself from the vicinity of where evil is. Let me give you this classic example from the Old Testament. It's the account of old uh, Potiphar's wife, Zuleika, Potiphar's wife. She was attempting to get her claws on innocent Joseph. You remember that story? Let me give you just a little bit of it from Genesis chapter 39, verse 6. Now Joseph, Israel's youngest boy, was well built and handsome. And I know when you read that, immediately you think of Pastor Terry. Just kidding, folks. Look at verse 7. And after a while, his master's wife, old Potiphar's main squeeze, took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. You see what's going on there? Hey, baby. Come here. Come to bed with me. Look at verse 8. But he refused. How many of you know most well-built and handsome men have a difficult time with this? Now, us skinny, ugly fellers, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> Are you with me? Say amen right now. <laughs> Wives out there punching everybody. He refused. Look at verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, around here we'd say every cotton picking day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her, he removed himself. That's a strategic action. Are you listening to me? Young people, you hear me? 
We go on down to verse 11 of Genesis 39. One day he went into the, to the house to attend to his duties. He worked for Potiphar. He was just doing his job. And none of the household servants, the other household servants, were inside or was inside. She, Zuleika, caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But the dude left his cloak in her hand and ran out the house. The dude ran out of his coat, left her standing there holding it. I told you that to tell you this. Fleeing the scene of evil is not an unwise thing. Are you tracking with me? Fleeing the scene of evil is not an unwise thing. But, but, there's another component that we also need to consider. This is kind of the crux of what I want you to see this morning and where we're headed in this series. That other thing is this. Watch this. It is strategically positioning yourself, meaning being Holy Spirit-led, strategically positioning yourself back into the troubled person's space in order to expose them or enlighten them and not only bring the truth to them, but also bring them to the truth. Pastor Terry, is there a difference between those two? I believe that there is. See, it's one thing for me just to bring the truth to people. You're going to get this truth whether you want it or not. If you've got ears, if you can hear, you're going to hear this. You're going to get it. As opposed to bringing people to the truth. Art thou withest me? Something to think about. Now, I know it freaks you out when I get profound like that. You don't think I can be that profound. But that's profound. Way too often, what I've just described is not the way that we, even church folks, strategically approach darkness. Rather, darkness is engaged by dark tactics. They throw rocks at us, and what do we do? We throw rocks, help me church, at them. You got an image of what I'm talking about here? Fill in number four or five, I guess it is, on your study notes. Attempting to combat darkness by utilizing the weapons and tactics of the dark is the height of stupid of foolishness. Foolishness. Didn't want Tucker Bug to hear that. <laughs> Beloved, that's precisely what we see unfolding in and along our streets and highways these days. Literally, we see that unfolding in our streets and highways. There's a different way, there's a better way. Let me say that again. There is a different way and a better way. And with that, I want to bring you back to 2 Corinthians, back to our text passage. And by, by way of uh, bringing you back there, I want to, to help you understand, remind you, if you please, what 2 Corinthians is. It isn't just a writing and a book. It isn't just a letter from one guy to someone else. But the 2 Corinthians is this. It is God's instructions. Whose instructions? And, and I believe, that again, this is what separates me from some others. I believe this is God's instructions to the called out ones, purpose to enable us to understand God's plan for our lives. Watch this. And it is set forth as a means by which we might persevere in that task. In other words, these are our marching orders. We need to understand them and not just read them, but heed them. Believe it or not, cried Pastor Terry, God speaks through the Apostle Paul. And again, let me reiterate, I don't think Paul just thought it was a good idea to write this down. I believe God spoke to him. The reason I, I believe that is because that's what the Word teaches us. God spoke through the Apostle Paul to enlighten us. Spoke to Paul way back then to enlighten us about how to navigate the, this tumultuous season of history 
that we're now destined to overcome. Now, beloved, Paul was very well qualified for the appointment. Go back with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look around verse 8. We read this. Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Look at verse 9. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. They thought they were going to die. You ever been in a situation like that? They thought they were going to die. In their hearts, they felt that sentence of death. But he says, this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, on the physical, but on God. Look at this, who raises the dead. Now, if you feel like you're about to be condemned to death, you're about to suffer death, then it's good news to know that God is one who raises the dead. Amen? Amen. What a, what a great point. Look at verse 10. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. Well, that was good for Paul. Look at this. And he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Have you set your hope on God that he will not only will deliver you, but that he will continue to, li- to deliver you? You know, here's, here's a common thing. A lot of people think you, you come to the Lord today and, and it's kind of some tough days, but then you learn how to do this thing and it gets easier and easier and easier. That's the way it is, church, right? That's not the way it is. You come to Christ and it might look a little, you don't know how to do it. You might be ignorant, but then you figure out how to do it. And then you begin to encounter and understand spiritual warfare. And you know that every day is a new struggle, not in the flesh, but in spiritual warfare. Let me tell you something. Spiritual warfare doesn't fight with the weapons we fight with. They don't throw rocks. It'd be better if they did. Because if they threw rocks, what would we do? We'd just go get behind a tree. Paul endured on the extreme edge all that we might endure today. He did so faithfully. I trust you're being faithful. He did so faithfully and he persevered through such struggles until such time as God drew him away to his reward. Now, I'm going to close with this rather abruptly, so hang on. I want you to pay attention to the way that Paul spoke to the Corinthians, even during an especially difficult time. If you go back and read underneath this passage, you will understand. I'm going to try to point this out to you in the the next part or two. But these Corinthians were being very sarcastic to Paul. Oh, you think you're all that in a bag of chips. Ugh. Oh, we're really scared of you. That's what's going on here. So he's enduring an especially difficult time. But with that, I want you to note that Paul resorts to winsome language and gestures. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. Paul says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I appeal to you. Did you know that Jesus Christ was a meek and gentle man? He was a meek and gentle man. Watch this. That does not mean that he was weak. It certainly does not mean that he was effeminate. That he was sissified. In fact, he grew up, grew up in the home of a carpenter. No doubt he was apprenticed in the, the carpenter skills of that day. How many of you know they didn't have a lot of power tools back then? Other than this ham bone right here. Yeah. Running cross-cut saws. Having to make their own nails, pegs. Lift beams without cramps, all kind of the post and the, the, it, it took a man to do that sort of thing. He was not a effeminate, uh, and by that I simply mean he wasn't sissified. You understand sissified? Now listen, being sissified is popular in America today. It's not all that popular with God. 
Don't you turn that off out there in live stream land. Trying to help you here. Listen, meek is a very unique quality. It's defined this way, number six on your study notes. It is gentle strength. That seems like a Nazi moron. Gentle strength, which expresses power, but it does so with reserve and gentleness. My friends, meek is a decision. Meek is a decision. It's a chosen action that is often contrary to that which one might consider normal. Meek is supremely illustrated by the very Son of God. And who is the Son of God? Jesus the Christ. It's illustrated by Jesus when His enemies subjected Him to outright torture. And instead of zapping Him, which He could have done with all the power of heaven, He humbly, meekly submitted to the shame and disgrace. Fill in number seven with me. Jesus' plight wasn't that he could not. Will you underline could not if it isn't underlined already? It's not that he could not stop his enemies, but that he chose not to react to them as they deserved. Look at your neighbor and say, deserved. That's meekness. One writer says it this way, it is a divinely balanced virtue. It's also established in the Word of God that Jesus was gentle. Not a Gentile, but that He was gentle. What's the difference between meek and gentle? Not a whole lot, but understand this. Gentle is the person, the individual that exercises something. It's physical, it's outward, it's an action. Whereas meek is basically giving the impression of submission to another. It's more emotional, therefore it's more internal. Now let me leave you with this to just summarize that. As I understand the two, meek and gentle, one must first purpose, one must first decide to be meek or submissive to another before actually following through with the outward actions that portray such meekness. In other words, gentleness. By the way, meek in its purest form, which form? In its purest form may actually be represented by the person that is offended. And from the outside looking in, it would appear that they are expressing no action at all. In other words, instead of smacking the lard out of some jerk that's all up in their grill, They rather choose to stand still and exude the salvation of the Lord. In that instance, what appears to be inaction is reality and action. Now, Pastor Terry, I've listened quietly for the last few moments. Waiting on you to tell me what this has to do with fighting and violence and and my behavior in today's world. Well, here we are. I'm at that point already. What does this have to do with fighting and violence and behavior in today's world? I'm going to tell you. Lord willing, next Sunday. This morning... I want to conclude this way. Here's today's application. Let me ask you, whether you're a male or female, whether you're a seasoned saint or a new believer, whether you're really a part of the church body or you're just checking this thing out, how is your meek? How is your meek? Boy, I have to ask myself, I'm talking 
your past, I have to ask myself this a lot. You probably haven't noticed, but I'm an animated person. Beloved, uh, we're going to wrap it up right there. Let me reiterate something to you. Meekness isn't when you are weak and you can't do anything against that which might be coming against you. Meekness is when you have the strength to move in and do something, perhaps to stop the enemy. You know, to put up, put up your nuke, so to speak. You have the physical strength to do that, but meekness is when you put forth the mental and spiritual and emotional resolve to handle it in another way. This is what I believe the Bible says to us about how to deal with the issue of sin and the enemy that attempts to bring sin into our life and attempts to confront us with sin. Now, that's not something you're going to get a hold of just uh, in your head. This is a spiritual issue that we're talking about. Uh, and it calls for a lot of prayer, a lot of study of the Word of God, a lot of memorization of the Word of God to get that in you so that when the pressure is on, that's what comes out. I trust that's beginning to make sense to you. I want to pray for you in just a moment. Before I do, I want to remind you that New Life does have a regular schedule of activities. We are meeting in person with some precautions, obviously, but we meet Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. Presently, we have midweek activities, and there's all kind of things that we do midweek. Uh, and that's been under duress lately with all of the precautions, but we're continuing to, uh, to move ahead in faith boldly uh, as God leads and directs us. We'd love to see you. We still, uh, still continue to have visitors, and that's always a great thing. Newcomers, as we like to refer to them, as they show up and uh, worship with us and become a part of who we are. That is our desire. We would love for that to be the case with you, in particular, if you do not have a place where you normally, regularly worship with God's people. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every person that's turned on this telecast, whether they've been walking with you for years, or they're brand new in their faith walk, or they're still trying to figure out just who you are and what kind of relationship you want to have with them. Lord, help them to know and understand that you love them, that you have a plan for their life, a perfect plan for their life. Draw them to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, you have a great week, what's left of it. I'm going to have to get out of here. This, I am Terry Knighton, the pastor of New Life Community Church. And beloved, I want to remind you that Jesus is coming back. Is he coming back for you?